An Introduction to Conjoint Analysis Section 1. How do you make choices? How many choices do you make during a typical day? Each day you make thousands of them. Some choices are trivial, like choosing which pair of socks to put on in the morning, or what to eat for breakfast. In fact, on average, people make 227 food-related decisions each day. Others are far more complex, like which life insurance policy to buy, or which mobile phone plan is the best for you. And some choices are laden with emotion, such as which cancer treatment you should pick for your child. We need to understand how people make choices so we can create better alternatives for them, as well as try to better predict their choices. These have always been principal concerns for those in the business world, such as managers, manufacturers, and advertisers. Government employees like city planners, educators, and those who create public policies. Economists, such as those in the industrial, environmental, and healthcare sectors and academics, particularly those in the economic, marketing, and social science departments. Many choices, as well as products, services, and alternatives, are composed of multiple attributes or features. For example, when deciding on which credit card to acquire, you would consider attributes such as brand, interest rate, annual fee, and credit limit. Or in the case of a cancer treatment, the likelihood of success, plus risks, plus pain factors, plus side effects, plus life disruption. If we learn how people value the components of an alternative, we are in a better position to design those that are more desirable and have a higher likelihood of choice. Ideally, we also want to create high-likelihood alternatives that are inexpensive and have a low cost to provide. And we can accomplish these goals with a statistical technique popularly called conjoint analysis, which is often used in market research and economics to determine how people value different features that make up a product or service. Did you know that the courtyard by Marriott Hotel chain was designed using a series of conjoint analysis studies? Section 2. So, what is conjoint analysis? The following YouTube video introduces and explains what conjoint analysis can do for you. Have you ever had to make a decision between two or more options in a situation where there are some things you like about one option and some things you like about the other? Of course you have. Now think of all the organizations out there trying to create successful products and services, not to mention sell them at just the right price. It's a complex, competitive world, and many managers are just making educated guesses about how best to appeal to consumers. Well, there's a proven approach for these product and service providers. It's called conjoint analysis. So what is conjoint analysis and what can it do for you? Conjoint analysis is a marketing insight technique for predicting how products you create or redesign should perform when taken to market. Companies win over consumers by putting in the right features and charging the right price. For example, smartphone manufacturers are packing more and more capabilities into these tiny devices with billions of dollars at stake if they get the right combinations of features and price. Hotels and resorts fine-tune their facilities and service levels to appeal to specific target markets, such as business travelers or luxury vacationers. Consumer packaged goods companies tweak their packaging, flavors, and nutritional contents to appeal to new market segments and create successful line extensions. Now let's consider Jane, who works for a company that manufactures bazoogles. A rival company across town came out with a new bazoogle, and Jane's sales have gone in the wrong direction. Now she's got a crisis on her hands. Bazoogles can have two to four snozzles, large or small monitors, and varying levels of noise, zoinks, and whiz bangs. 
The problem is, there are thousands of combinations of features, and Jane needs to come up with the right combination at the right price to regain market share. Jane has some ideas that she could concept test among a sample of potential customers. She could describe potential bazoogles and ask potential customers to tell her how much they would like to buy each one. Of course, she doesn't have enough time, money, or customers to do enough of these concept tests. What she really needs is a smarter, more scientific way to test thousands of possible bazoogles to find the optimal one. That's where conjoint analysis comes in. To start, Jane does some research so she can list the key attributes and levels of her and her competitors' bazoogles. For example, a bazoogle could have three snozzles, a small monitor, high noise, and shoot out 30 zoinks per minute. Conjoint analysis software systematically combines the features from Jane's list to show competing bazoogles at different prices. Consumers simply pick one from each scenario, much like they do in the real world. You can see why it's often called discrete choice analysis. Across a sample of respondents, numerous combinations are shown and the software keeps track of how often different features were chosen at different prices when offered on different bazoogles. Using statistical analysis, the software estimates preference scores for each consumer in the sample. Combinations of features that are chosen a lot get high utility scores. In essence, conjoint analysis has taken a snapshot of each consumer's brain and derived a statistical model that quantifies the preferences that led them to choose different bazoogles and pay for them the way they do. It's almost like Jane has captured hundreds of virtual consumers with their decision-making rules within the software on her computer. She's now got a what-if market simulator that acts like a voting machine for bazoogles. She can specify any of thousands of potential bazoogles in her conjoint analysis software, and the virtual consumers will vote on those potential bazoogles versus her competitors. Better yet, if Jane knew something about the cost of manufacturing the features, the software could search all potential bazoogles to find the one that's likely to beat the competition and maximize profit. Most any time people face decisions among different options made up of conjoined features, you could develop key insights into consumer choice using conjoint analysis. As you can imagine, the potential applications are numerous. And if you want to make more than one version of your product to target distinct market segments, conjoint analysis helps you do that too. Conjoint analysis is unlike common survey approaches that try to ask respondents what's important in a product and how much they're willing to pay. Instead, respondents choose from realistic product options like they would in the real world. The most commonly used conjoint analysis approach today is choice-based conjoint, CBC. It's based on some of the same theories that won Dr. Dan McFadden the Nobel Prize in Economics. We hope this presentation has helped to explain some basics of conjoint analysis and show how it can benefit those trying to create the right product at the right price for consumers. If you'd like to learn more about conjoint analysis, feel free to visit us at sawtoothsoftware.com. In our attempts to learn what people want, traditionally, researchers have written surveys that ask people about their preferences, such as, which brand do you prefer? What interest rate would you like? And how much risk are you willing to take? But such answers are often trivial or unenlightening. For example, most respondents prefer low interest rates to high interest rates and low risk to high risk. We don't learn anything we didn't already know. So, in order to learn what is important, researchers have posed survey questions to ask about importance. For example, when choosing a credit card, how important is it that you get the brand, interest rate, annual fee, and credit limit that you want? However, stated importance ratings often have low discrimination because many people tend to say that everything is important. But that's not the way the real world works. You can't have all of the features at the lowest price. 
Otherwise, the seller wouldn't make any profit and would quickly go out of business. For example, you cannot have the highest fuel efficiency and also the most performance. You cannot have a high-performance Lamborghini that gets 96 miles to the gallon. So, conjoint analysis mimics the real world and doesn't allow people to say everything is important. As in the real world, respondents have to make trade-offs. In a conjoint analysis survey, you are asked to choose among alternatives that aren't ideal in every way. You have to make some compromises or trade-offs. Do you want more credit and a higher interest rate or less credit and a lower interest rate? Observing such choices gives the researcher insight into what really drives people's decisions and provides the data to make more accurate predictions about future choices. On the SawtoothSoftware.com website, we have created an interactive choice-based conjoint questionnaire that you may complete to see how this process works. It involves choosing food for dinner at a baseball game. You complete a quick nine-question survey, and it will analyze your results using simple counting analysis. It will also compare your answers to others who have completed the survey and place all of these results into a what-if simulator. With a simulator, you can pick different product combinations and see what respondents would have picked if only those combinations were available. Check it out. It's at sawtoothsoftware.com slash baseball. Section 3. What outputs can you get from conjoint analysis? Conjoint analysis provides three main types of output that help us understand what people want and, and to make better predictions. These deliverables are part worth utilities, importance scores, and market simulations. Let's take a look at these one at a time. Conjoint part worth utilities are numeric values that reflect the desirability of different features. For example, let's assume that we're evaluating the flavors and prices of a scoop of ice cream. For a given respondent, we might find that vanilla has a utility of 2.5 and chocolate has a utility of 1.8. Furthermore, the prices have part worth utilities as well. At 25 cents per scoop, the utility score is 5.3. At 35 cents, it is 3.2 and at 50 cents, it is 1.4. The higher the utility, the better, or the more desirable. Conjoint importances are a measure of how much influence each attribute has on people's choices. It is calculated by taking the best level of each attribute and subtracting the worst level, percentaged. In other words, for this particular respondent, we take the utility for vanilla and subtract the utility for chocolate, and we get 0 0.7. Then we select the best price utility, and subtract the worst price utility, which gives us 3.9. We add those two subtotals and get 4.6. Then we figure out the percentage by dividing 0.7 by 4.6 to get 15.2, and dividing 3.9 by 4.6 to get 84.8%. Importances are directly affected by the range of levels you choose for each attribute. Now let me say that again. Importances are directly affected by the range of levels you choose for each attribute. The third deliverable you get from conjoint analysis is the what-if market simulator. With a simulator, you make competitive market scenarios and predict which products respondents would choose. How do we do that? By accumulating or aggregating respondent predictions to make shares of preference for the sample. For example, let's consider the part worth utilities for respondent number one. Let's predict which cone she would pick if the only two choices were a 35 cent vanilla cone and a 25 cent chocolate cone. We take the part worth utility for vanilla and add it to the part worth utility for 35 cents, and we get a total utility of 
Next, we sum the utilities for chocolate at $0.25, cents and we get 7.1. So we predict that respondent number one would choose the chocolate cone. Then we repeat for the rest of the respondents based on their individual utilities. In essence, a market simulator is like a voting machine. So let's assume we have responses for 500 respondents. After loading their utilities into the market simulator, we might see shares of preference like this, where 65% of respondents prefer the 25 cent chocolate cone, while 35% prefer the 35 cent vanilla cone. Even though the majority may have a higher utility for vanilla over chocolate, when price is factored into the product, they choose chocolate. Section 4 Market Simulator Assumptions To interpret the results of the market simulator correctly, we need to be aware of some assumptions underlying conjoint analysis data. First, all attributes that affect buyer choices in the real world have been accounted for. Second, each product has equal availability or distribution across the marketplace. Third, respondents are aware of all products in the market. Fourth, that products have achieved long-range equilibrium. Fifth, the sales forces for the different product alternatives are equally effective. And sixth, you will never, ever have any out-of-stock conditions. Now, because these assumptions are often violated, shares of preference from conjoint simulators don't always match real-world market shares. In fact, all the conjoint simulator assumptions usually don't hold true in the real world. But this doesn't mean that conjoint simulators are not valuable. Simulators turn esoteric utilities into concrete shares of choice among competitive offerings that sum to 100% and are easy for decision makers to understand. Assuming a level playing field then, conjoint simulators predict respondents' interest in products or services. The results help managers understand people's preferences and design alternatives that achieve higher choice likelihood. Did you know that conjoint analysis was used to improve childbirth health care delivery in rural Tanzania? Section 5. So, what is the value of a conjoint simulator? Let's take a look at some examples. A conjoint simulator lets you play what-if games to investigate the value of modifications to an existing product or alternative. It lets you predict which healthcare treatment options respondents or segments of the population will choose. It lets you estimate how to design new products to maximize buyer interest at low manufacturing cost. It lets you investigate product line extensions. For example, does our proposed new offering cannibalize our own share or take mostly from competitors? And it lets you estimate demand curves. Did you know that conjoint analysis was used to study how to manage the positive economic effects of snorkeling and diving tourism versus the impact on the coral reefs in the British Virgin Islands? There are different approaches for conducting conjoint analysis. Nowadays, the most popular is choice-based conjoint, or CBC which some people call discrete choice. Another variant is adaptive choice-based conjoint, or ACBC, which is a recent adaptive variation on the popular CBC method. Here are three key luminaries who have contributed to the development of conjoint analysis, or its close relative discrete choice analysis, dating back to the 1970s. Of course, there's always room for more. We invite you to continue your study of conjoint analysis. One day, perhaps your contributions will take this exciting field to even greater heights. This concludes the presentation. Thank you for watching. For more information, 
please visit sawtoothsoftware.com.